All right, so uh, Luke 22, we'll pick up where we left off uh, last week. We covered, I believe, from verses 14 through, uh, through 34 last week. This week, we're going to pick up here in uh, verse 35 in just a moment. But today, we're going to continue um, this study, as we will be here for a bit, uh, in the last uh, hours of the life, the physical, uh, uh, earthly life of Jesus. And as we began and, and, and ended uh, last week, on the Lord's uh, Supper and, and ultimately on the, on the disciples' verbal grab for power, today we begin with an all too common misunderstanding that the disciples uh, had with uh, a statement that Christ had made. And then we'll continue through the account in the Garden of Gethsemane and and we'll see if we can get beyond that today, but I, I don't really think so. But uh, let's just read through verses 35 through 38 first, and then we'll uh, expound on this. It says, And he said to them, When I sent you without money bag, knapsack, and sandals, did you lack anything? So they said nothing. In other words, they didn't, not that they said nothing. They, in other words, nothing. We didn't like anything. Verse 36, and then he said to them, But now he who has a money bag, let him take it. And likewise a knapsack, and he who has no sword, let him sell his garment to buy one. For I say to you that this which is written must still be accomplished in me. This is... Uh, prophecy from the Old Testament that he's now quoting and saying it finds its fulfillment in him, that he's the fulfillment of this. And it says, and he was numbered with the transgressors. And for the things concerning me have an end. And so they said, look, or Lord, look, here are two swords. And he said to them, it is enough. Now, Jesus is preparing them in part, preparing them for trouble ahead, as what he's really saying here is that things are changing. Things aren't like they were leading up to this point in my ministry in your involvement with me in ministry, things were much more easygoing or much more peaceful, so to speak. But things are going to get hairy, as we would say. Things are going to get difficult, increasingly so. The climate of things is changing. And when we read here in verses 35 through 38, Jesus is speaking in metaphor. He's speaking metaphorically here. Uh, we know that for a number of reasons. When you go into the Greek, I'm not going to give you all the, the details of that right now, but when you go into the Greek uh, and you look at the tense, um, uh, you see it there and, 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 and elsewhere. But did you have everything that you needed? is what he's saying to them. When in the past I would send you out and, and the 12 would go out and the 70 would go out and they would go and speak of the Lord and did you have everything that you needed? When I just sent you out and told you, don't take anything with you, just, you know, keep it simple. That's one of the reasons why for some of you guys who, who are always asking me about going camping, why it's just a difficult, I, I, I don't know if I can just be that simple, you know? It's just like like a tent and... Water and some food. And it's like, no, I've got to have this. And for me to go, you know, camping means you go get a cabin and you got it stuffed with all kinds of things. And, you, you know, I don't know. I just, you know, so it would be difficult for me, I suppose. But, but he's saying that things are changing. In the past, you'd go, you'd minister, you had everything that you needed, but you took nothing with you. Such simplicity. I love that. 
But now it's going to be different. I sent you out. I sent you out in more favorable times. Yes. But Jesus was not, or was clearly, I should say, not speaking literally here. And there's a number of reasons why. One of such is two swords. If you think about this, everyone knows this. Any man would know this. Anyone with half a brain would know this. Certainly, Jesus knows that two swords are not going to take down all the Roman guard that would be meeting him in the garden later that night. Okay? So, let's be honest. We understand that. We know that. And, and by the way, it, it didn't. <laughs> we know that as well. Number two, the battle at hand was spiritual and not physical. It's a spiritual battle. Remember, in the Old Testament, as it says, the battle belongs to what? The man. The battle belongs to the flesh. The battle belongs to, you know, what guns we have or armament we have or, or how well we can, you know, how good of a street fighter we are or whatever it might be. No, the battle belongs to the Lord. And we think for just a moment, think about the battle that you're in. I believe that we are probably all in a battle. Actually, I'm, I'm not even going to say. I believe that every one of us are in a battle. Uh, although some of us may not recognize it. Some of us may not realize it. Some of us may be turning a deaf ear to it or just want it to go away so we just pretend it doesn't exist. But we're all in a battle. Right off the bat, if you are called by his name, there is a battle going on. There's a battle going on. And it's not easy. Do you ever wonder? Maybe you've experienced this. I've known of people. Wow. <laughs> you come to Christ and things get harder. I, didn't, I haven't found that things in, have gotten easier since I came to the Lord. No. It's gotten, in, in certain regards, harder. In certain regards, easier. But in, in, I would say in, in, in many regards, it's gotten more difficult. I've known others the same thing. And I could speak about why that is, but... Uh, We'll do that another time. But thirdly, Jesus needed to go to the cross. And at the very specified time when he needed to go to the cross, in fulfillment of Scripture, and there is a very spe specified time, we've spoken about that as well. If sword could or would stop that event, there would be no one in church today. There would be no need or no purpose to gather because Christ did not pay for our sins, because Christ did not rise from the dead, because our hope would be in vain. He needed to go to the cross. He did not need, he did not want anyone or anything, not that anyone or anything could, but he did not need or want anything to stop that process. It had to be. He went willingly to the cross. He was in total, full control of every moment and every event, knowing that it would bring about the salvation of many. Can we turn the air up just a little bit in here? It's a little arctic. So there's so many other reasons why this becomes abundantly clear that Jesus was not wanting them literally to bring swords to defend him against the Romans, not only against the Romans, but against um, um, the priests and scribes and Pharisees, Sadducees, all of them as well. Jesus needed to go to the cross. He went there for the joy that was set before him, as we shared last week or the week before, and that joy set before him was, is, you, and me. Now we see all these things, and we also see that Jesus was saying all of this to prepare them. Just as a father may prepare his son or daughter, or a mother may prepare a son or daughter for getting older, or what may be on the horizon. Jesus knew what was on the horizon. He knew in the hours that would come, in the days that would come, 
He knew even in the weeks and the months and the years and decades, millennial that would come, the persecution that would befall so many in the body of Christ. You know it all too well. Jesus is saying to be prepared because change is coming. In the past, you weren't largely rejected or persecuted. You were received for the most part, they were. But now all of that is beginning to change. We can look at the news that I just reported before we got into the Word. What's been taking place in California and moving ahead and, you know, brought to the ballot and then, you know, it passes the Senate, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You see where things are going. It's not getting better. It's not getting easier. The good news is in Jesus Christ, but everything else is bad news out there and it's getting worse. And the word of God said it's going to get worse and we have to be prepared for it. I wish I could stand here today and tell you it's going to get better. And yes, it is going to get better, but that's down the road. It's going to get Far worse, my friends, far worse before it gets better. That's the reality. He's telling them, be prepared. Be spiritually prepared. I find at times that we just, as they, I would say, miss the point. How many times do we read and they just, they just weren't getting what Jesus was saying? And maybe we read and we have the hindsight. It's easy to be a Monday morning, you know, uh, quarterback or whatever. You know, it's easy to look back and say, oh, you know, or that play should have been done or that whatever it might be. But when you're in the thick of it, it's just not that easy. Let's be honest. And we just tend to miss the point as, as, as they did oftentimes. The point that everything changes on account of the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Everything changes. If your life hasn't changed as a result of the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, then it would be argued that you are not His. Because Christ came to bring change. He didn't save us to remain the same, did He? Do you want to remain the same? I don't want to remain the same. I don't need to remain the same. The old man is death to me. The old man, the old woman, should be death to you. What good was it in those things that brought us hurt, that brought us pain, that separated us from the love of God? No good. No good at all. It didn't save us to remain the same. But all of this here, everything changes on account of the death and resurrection of Christ. Jesus as, as healer, Jesus as working miracles, multiplying the, the, the fish and the loaves and, and so many things. What about speaking of, of love, as he would speak about, about loving God and loving one another, loving those that hate you, loving those that are difficult, all of those things. You'll find few that oppose those things. Love. And who doesn't want love? Well, there's some song somebody sang a long time ago, looking for love in all the wrong places. You know, we all did it. Might be at the bottom of a bottle. Might have been at the tip of a needle. Might have been from pulling a handle. Ting, 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 ting. It might have been from one affair after another. But we're all we're looking for love. And we're looking in the wrong places because none of those things can ever fulfill the need in the heart of man. There's a need for God. We were created for fellowship with God. We were created for worship of God. We were created to know Him, to enjoy Him. And when He would work miracles and heal the sick and speak about the love of God, those were popular. But now things are changing. He's going to the cross. Everyone would look at Christ as a failure, even the apostles. Even they would look at him as a failure. It wasn't going the way that they thought it would all go. 
They were confused, and they were scared. And yes, they scattered, and they ran. Because everything changes with the cross of Christ. Do you get that? Everything changes at the cross and the empty tomb. I say that, and I believe really echoing really where he has gone with what he's, his statement here, or statements here in these verses, because, hey, you can speak about the love of God to people at work. Oh, yeah, God loves you. Oh, yes, God, God loves me, and I love God. And you know that they don't love God. You can see a tree is known by its fruit. Like I've said before, no fruit, no root. Okay? You can tell if anyone has any root in Christ because they got the fruit in Christ. You don't have no fruit. You have no root. Come on. But you start talking about the fact that Jesus is the only way. You start talking about the fact that there's no other way that man can be saved. You start talking about the narrow road, right? You start talking about the cross and about Jesus' bodily resurrection from the dead. And all of a sudden, you got enemies. All of a sudden, you got enemies. Hey, come on. some of these enemies, I, 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 I don't know how else to say it. Maybe I'm not choosing the best words. And I don't. Some of these people are our family. Some of these people are our family. We start talking about Christ. Didn't Jesus already warn them? You start, you start telling them about me, you know. And daughter's going to have issue with father or with mother or mother-in-law and, and, and son with father or father-in-law. Husband against wife, wife against husband, in-law against in-law, employee against employer, or whatever it might be. The cross, it's all because of the cross. People don't like to be told there's only one way. You're so narrow-minded, you Christians. Yes, exactly. I wear it as a badge of honor. Not in some way where it's like, well, you know. But as a badge of honor, yes. Narrow-minded because Christ said it's the narrow way. And as I've said before, I'm glad that it's a narrow way. Because I get too distracted, guys. I do. If it's, if it's wide and there's too much look, you know, off to the side to look at and everything, I, when I'm driving, I'm just driving off the side. Of the, you know, it, it gets distracting for me. If it's narrow, give me a few choices. I wish that I could go to the store. Like you go to Walmart, I call it Stuff Mart. You go to Stuff Mart, you know, you want to buy toothpaste. This is why missionaries have such a hard time. They come back on furlough after being, you know, in, in the place that they're in you know, for a couple of years or whatever, they come back and you tell them, you know, hey, you need to go buy some, you know, they need to go buy some toothpaste or whatever. Well, hey, in Thailand or this place or that place, man, there's three kinds to choose from, you know. You come to Stuff Mart and there's like 35 kinds to choose from, you know. And that's just on one shelf. Then there's another, you know, I mean, it's, it gets overwhelming. Too wide, too much, too many choices. Jesus made it easy. It's one way. And he proved that he is the way. And I get an amen. He proved that he is the way. Things are changing, he's telling them. And things have changed for us. Don't run from it. He warned us multiple times to expect these things, to expect persecution, to expect hardship. But be encouraged in this. If God be for us, you can finish it. Who will be against us? Amen. If God be for us. And if you are in Christ, if your faith is in the Lord, then you know what? God is for you. God is for you. Oh, but bad things are happening in my life. Wake up. We live in a fallen world. Come on. It's a fallen world. It's not always going to be this way. But I'm, in one regard, it, it, it served its purpose because God used it to draw me to Christ. If everything was so great in my life, what would I ever see my need for the Lord? How would you see your need for the Lord if everything was so great? If everything was so easy, would you see your need for the Lord? I doubt it. I doubt it. Most people come to Christ in the valley. Most people grow in Christ in the valley. So allow God to use the valley in your life to draw you to Him or to draw you closer 
to him. And so we see all of these things really, I believe, uh, here hidden away in these verses. But people don't like that message. Or many people don't like that message. They fight us, so to speak, with all they have and with all they know. But all they have and all they know is the flesh. They can't fight spiritually against you. They, fl- they fight with the flesh. Not so with us. In Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 through 13, it says, and if you can look on the screen, it says, For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. It's a spiritual war. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand in the evil day and having done all to stand. Next verse. Oh, no, actually, wait, did I? We missed, there we go. Okay. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. That's what I want to look at here for just a moment. You see, we don't have a foot or a leg or whatever to stand on if we don't have the armor of God. We have nothing to stand on. You can't have the armor of God if you're an unbeliever. If you're not saved through faith in Jesus Christ, you don't have the armor of God. It's not there. You don't have it. But I'm going to say something else. Many Christians, even though the armor is available to a Christian, I think a lot of times the armor is just, it's just there. It's in the closet. You know, it's hanging up next to that suit, next to that dress, next to that T-shirt. And it's just hanging there, that armor. It's no good if we don't put on the armor of God. It doesn't say look at the armor of God. Check out the armor. Oh, how nice the armor is, you know. Get the little feather duster, dust the armor, you know. Or maybe get some armor all for the armor, you know. And it's so nice, and there's the armor. And we don't put on the armor of God. Well, let's look at verse, or let's, let's continue here. In verse 39, he says, it says, coming out, <clears throat> he went to the Mount of Olives as he was accustomed, and his disciples also followed him. Actually, I'm just going to read all these verses here, and then we'll come back. When he came to the place, he said to them, pray that you might not enter into temptation. And he was withdrawn from them about a stone's throw, and he knelt down and prayed, saying, Father, if it is your will, Take this cup away from me, nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done, or your will be done. And then the angel appeared to him from heaven, or an an angel appeared to him from heaven, strengthening him. Being in agony, verse 44, he prayed more earnestly. And then his sweat became like great drops of blood falling down to the ground. And when he rose up from prayer and had come to his disciples, he found them sleeping sleeping from sorrow. And then he said to them, why do you sleep? Rise and pray lest you enter into temptation. So I'd like you to just kind of cast your eyes here for a moment on verse uh, 39. Coming out, he went to the Mount of Olives. Christ and the disciples would have left Jerusalem, they would have left Jerusalem and crossed to get from Jerusalem to the Mount of Olives. And on the Mount of Olives, you could, you could look and the temple that was standing at that time was probably three to four hundred feet lower than, than the height of the Mount of Olives. Um, but the Mount of Olives is right there. To get to the Mount of Olives from Jerusalem, you're going to cross a valley. That valley is called the Kidron Valley. I'm sure you've probably uh, heard of it. Um, you've probably heard about a brook that, uh, that would run uh, uh, there in the Kidron Valley, um, not all year round, but just at a certain time. I think it was wintertime. And uh, uh, called the Brook Kidron. 
So you would cross from Jerusalem, cross this uh, Kidron Valley, perhaps have to cross the, the brook, whether it was a dry brook or, or actually flowing at the time, and then um, up to the Mount of Olives. Um, at the foot of the Mount of Olives, you would have the Garden of Gethsemane. Okay, That's kind of how it all kind of looked, if you're uh, picturing this in your head. The Kidron Valley, and then, uh, like I said, the Garden of Gethsemane and the Mount of Olives and all of this. Now, the, the Kidron Valley between these two places would... Uh, uh, and has, at least had, uh, and, and you know, millennial past, would have blood running through, running down to it, and running through the brook uh, uh, Kidron, okay? You'd have blood in there and water in there that would come from the temple, from uh, the sacrifices of the animals there on the temple, and the blood would be shed, and that blood all had to go somewhere, and it, and that's what would happen. We've read about this um, in the word before. We know this to be the case. And literally that brook would run red with blood from the temple sacrifices. And, and the water, not only did the brook have its, its water there, but as well uh, water was used in uh, part of the purification process up there um, in the temple on Temple Mount. Anyhow, a, a lot of information, but I believe it's really uh, uh, very significant here. Um, first of all, it's interesting, and I love what the meanings of names. Um, Kidron actually means uh, dark, murky, dusky, uh, gloomy. And it's interesting that that's what it means, and it would be. Uh, darker at times, uh, or musky, or gloomy, or, or, or murky, if blood was running through there, wouldn't it? Interesting um, that that's the actual uh, uh, name of it there. Um, to the north of Jerusalem um, begins the, the, uh, the Kidron, and then it goes past the Temple Mount, uh, ultimately, and um, um, and so on and so forth. Nonetheless, in the winter, it would have, you know, those waters there. In the summertime, it would normally be uh, dry, uh, a dry bed. John, and you don't need to turn there, but if you're taking notes, John 18.1, John tells us that uh, Jesus went out with his disciples um, to and, and, and ultimately across that valley uh, to get over to uh, the garden. It says, when Jesus had spoken these words, he went forth with his disciples over the brook Kidron. So we're not reading that in this account here in Luke, um, but we read it um, with more detail there, obviously, in, in John chapter 18. So between Temple Mount, Garden of Gethsemane, or um, uh, Mount of Olives, all of that, you would have this right here. They had to walk through it. They had to walk through it. I believe that it is rather significant that they walked through that part. In the Old Testament, we see that during the period of the divided kingdom, during the period of the divided kingdom, that there were um, uh, a minimum, at least, that we see of three uh, cleansings that took place in the temple. One of those cleansings was uh, from one of my favorite Bible characters, uh, Josiah. Uh, I love the name, too, but um, one of the cleansings uh, was from him. But we'd read of those cleansings, of all of the, the altars, all of the, the idols, the false idols that were there. And, and you know, at times... The people would rise up or a uh, king would rise up. Uh, normally it would, it would kind of begin there and kind of flow down. And, and they would recognize, we've got to get right with God. We've got to cleanse house, so to speak, you know, of all of these things that are an offense to God, these false gods, false idols. And um, one of the kings that did that was King Asa. King Asa. And uh, he destroyed these idols and he burned them. Guess where? The Kidron Valley. Dark, murky, gloomy. Yes, it is 
a, uh, that kind of a place, and that's where where that would have been burned. First Kings chapter fifteen, um, you'll see that, or or another cleansing had taken place under King uh, Hezekiah. We read about that in Second Chronicles tap, uh, chapter twenty nine. Then uh, uh, at another time, as I spoke, um, King Josiah, which was uh, this took place before the Babylonian captivity. He did the same uh, as well. I like, and I, I'm going to quote here, something that Pastor John MacArthur said. He writes in a book, or his book, Experiencing the Passion, um, and said that the historical records of Jesus' time indicate that as many as a quarter million lambs, that's 250,000 lambs, would be slain in a typical Passover season. Wow. Requiring hundreds of priests, he said, to carry out uh, this task. He said that there would be a tremendous amount of blood that would be uh, drained from, obviously, hundreds of thousands of, of lambs. And then there was the water used in the ritual uh, cleansing. Why are we talking so much about this valley and the blood and the sacrifice because the perfect sacrifice jesus christ crossed through that area crossed through that spot and in john chapter 19 verse 34 if you're taking notes it says one of the soldiers with a spear pierced his side hours later pierced his side and what came forth water and blood. Nothing is written in God's word that says, oh wow, that just means nothing. God just wanted to say something because it has no meaning, no purpose, no symbolism in our lives. Absolutely not. God uh, says what he means and means what he says. He knows what he does. And we need to know why he does what he does and what he says and why he says what he says. We need to understand it says in John 4, 14, whoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him. Think about this. The water that I shall give him will never thirst, but the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing into everlasting life. So much importance in the water and in the blood at this very specific time. Not only that, but in 2 Samuel, interestingly enough, we read of the Kidron Valley. Do you remember? Now, we know that Christ would be rejected, right? He was rejected as king, wasn't he? Now, they were thinking, they weren't thinking king of kings, lord of lords, almighty God, you know, king of heaven. They were just looking for king over, you know, over Israel, over the Roman Empire. They were looking for an earthly, worldly king. But nonetheless, he was rejected as king. You know who else was rejected in king? One who, when you speak of typology, a uh, very interesting type of Christ in typology, David. David, the second king of Israel. David was rejected as king. Remember, he had to flee. He had to flee the palace. Who had caused an uprising against him but his own son, one who was so close to him, Absalom, who was used to try and bring Christ down, one who was, what, close to him, Judas Iscariot. But something else that I find more fascinating than all of this, when Absalom had tried to ascend to take the position of king, away from his father and be king himself, we see in 2 Samuel that David fled Jerusalem and he crossed the Kidron to the Mount of Olives and to the wilderness. It's interesting. Not only that, but we believe that Psalm chapter 3, I should say Psalms chapter 3 and chapter 41 were written... Uh, by David at this exact moment when this was going on in his life. Why is that so interesting? And I'll tell you. 
Because when Jesus had spoke to Judas about betraying him, we read that in John chapter 13 and elsewhere, he referenced the prophecy from David's psalm in Psalm 41, 9. Of all places, but that's where he went to. Psalm 41, 9. He who ate my bread has lifted up his heel against me. None of this is by coincidence. You can't make this stuff up. You can't. You just can't make it up and have it all fulfilled and have it all come to pass. But we find it all fulfilled in the Lord. By the way, remember Judas was hanged, or he he hung himself, I should say. Judas hung himself, right? Do you know how Absalom died? He was hung, basically. Well, he was hung, and then he was cut down. He was hung. And you know where that took place? Took place right in that area. You know where the tree was located? Gethsemane. Same part. Same area. It's just, it's, it's just, to me, it's just, it, it's fascinating how all of that comes together in God's word. Nonetheless, Jesus was pierced, and, or would be, and blood and water would flow. And so I believe that this place, the, the, the Kidron, speaks of death. It's murky, it's dark. It speaks of death, it speaks of the payment of sin by way of the substitutionary sacrifice of sacrificial blood, most specifically the blood of Jesus Christ. And the water speaks of cleansing to everlasting life. Now let's journey with Jesus to the garden for a moment. Let's journey with Jesus to the garden. And I've got I've to say how fascinated I am with this garden. Absolutely fascinated. By the way, they say, according to studies, and I don't know, I, I don't know much about this stuff, but they say that the um, olive trees there, are, they can date uh, many of them back to about 900 years ago. They've been there a long time. Um, there has been some conjecture that uh, some of the olive trees that are there in the garden Um, are still some of the olive trees or were some of the original trees that were there um, when uh, when we're reading this account in the word of God. It's very doubtful, though, um, from some other things that we read historically. Um, But I just put that out there uh, for you. Um, But it is doubtful. But nonetheless, you can do your own uh, research in regards uh, to that. But the garden, very interesting. Uh, I'm fascinated with the garden. When we read in the book of, of, I almost said Revelation, the book of Genesis, we read about a garden, don't we? We read about a garden in the book of Genesis, the Garden of Eden. And man was put in the garden, wasn't he? Man was put in that garden, and where did sin begin? Sin of mankind began in a garden. It was in this garden that God began to speak of his plan to redeem man. It's hidden there within the verses in chapter 3. It's fascinating. In the garden, man was deceived. Garden of Eden. In the garden of Gethsemane, we find the truth of Messiah, where there is no deceit, where there's just truth. Deceit found in one garden, the truth. As Christ even said, I am the way and the truth and the life, and no man comes to the Father but by me. Truth was found in the garden of Gethsemane. We find truth there. Death would eventually come to man from sin committed in the Garden of Eden. But life would eventually come to man from Christ's act of obedience to the Father. Remember? As Christ prayed, thy will be done. Nonetheless, Father, thy will be done, or your will be done. In the first garden, we see the first Adam and his rejection of God's will and God's plan. 
in the second garden, the garden of Gethsemane. In the second garden, we see what we often call the second Adam. We see this in the New Testament, speaking of Jesus Christ. Jesus there, we see. And I venture to say that there may be uh, more comparisons between these two gardens, but it's really fascinating to really look at, the, uh, at some interesting uh, parallels and whatnot between the two. Now, something else, Gethsemane. The name Gethsemane means uh, oil press or, or olive press. I think olive press is actually more accurate, um, but I'll put them both out there for you. Olive press, very significant as well. It could have been named something else and meant something else, but no. It had to be called Gethsemane, which means olive press. Gethsemane, uh, the olive trees there, the, the garden, like I said, is at the, uh, uh, at the foot uh, there of the Mount uh, of Olives. But nonetheless, you know that uh, those olives would have to be pressed. Those olives would have to be uh, crushed to extract the oil. And the oil from, from olives, from olive trees is, I mean, even today it's expensive. You ever see some of the price of some of the olive oil uh, in the stores? You're like, I mean, you can buy a bottle of, of certain brands and it's like $35 for some of this stuff. It's ridiculous. But back then, it was even more valuable. What the oil, would, would the uses of it, we're not, I'm not going to get into that uh, today, but it was very valuable. It was very precious. So too, is our Lord so precious, and he was bruised for us. He was crushed for us. He was pressed, so to speak, for us there in the garden. And yes, even to the point of just such anguish in prayer that blood began to form, Sweats of blood form and drop to the ground. There are those that that say that that can't happen, but they don't understand medical science. Medical science makes it very clear that it can, and the name of this is hematridosis. It's also called uh, blood sweat. It's a rare condition. Obviously, I've never seen it happen to anyone. Maybe you have. Uh, in which a human being can actually sweat blood. Uh, It's a medical fact. Many people don't know this. Hematridosis under extreme mental and emotional anguish, um, the small capillaries near the the surface of the the skin uh, will begin to dilate, you know, and it allows the blood to come to the surface um, mixed with water or sweat. And so even there we see blood and water Uh, flowing or blood mingling uh, with water. Uh, Again, it's all very fascinating uh, to me. Why was there such anguish in his prayer? Because he knew and he recognized the fact that he would be separated from the Father because as Scripture says, he who knew no sin became sin for us, right? Remember, What was said on the cross when he said, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, meaning, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The Father, at that moment, because he who knew no sin became sin for us, in other words, our sins were heaped upon him, became sin for us. Sin causes us to be rejected by the Father. Sin separates us from God. Sin causes a separation. And at that moment, Christ was separated from the Father. And I personally believe that that was the greatest anguish, is knowing that separation, that He who was, who is eternal, the second person of the Trinity, was going to experience something He had never experienced experienced before all the pain that would be coming paled physically in comparison to the emotional and spiritual pain that he knew he was going to endure 
and he was willing to endure it for you and me. And I'm going to end on this point this morning, and we'll pick back up next week. But Christ went through all of this, all of these things that we read about, the cleansings of the temple under Asa and, and Josiah and, and Hezekiah and, and, and perhaps even more, and all the symbolism with the Brook Kidron and the Kidron Valley and the blood that would flow down into that area and Christ crossing from Jerusalem to the Mount of Olives where blood and water would flow from him right there that night. In the hours following that, and that spear would pierce him and blood and water flowed. Interesting. And by the way, there, there's uh, some interesting significance to that too. We just don't have time to get into that this morning. Uh, none of this is by coincidence that he was in a place of crushing. He was crushed for you and for me. And I want to leave us on this this morning. If this is you this morning, how can you? Why would you reject such love? My goodness. I mean, just think for a moment, my friends. No one is going to love you like that. Nobody else could love you like that because no one can pay the price of your sins to, to, to your salvation. A, because no human being is God. We've all been born into sin separated from God because of it, but not Christ. No one else could, even if they wanted to, do what Jesus has done for you. I've just got to ask, why on earth would you ever reject that? I, 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 it makes no sense. If, if you're here this morning and you haven't received Christ, Time is short. We know the things that are coming upon the world. And not only that, but God's word te tells us, teach us the number of days. We don't know when, how long we've got. Our life could be required of us tonight. Are you ready? If you have not Christ as Lord of your life, you have no entrance into the presence of God for all eternity. There's no hope for your soul. But now church, church, think about this. Maybe you came to the Lord weeks ago, months ago, years ago, decades ago. And you just find yourself in this place of prevailing lethargy, weakness, spiritual weakness, apathy towards the Lord and the things of God. Again, in a slightly different way, I must ask the same question. Why? You who know the truth, and you who the truth, you, me, us, we, and the truth has set us free, for crying out loud. As the church, we must wake up. Why would we treat the sacrifice of Christ is a common thing. Why would we not take seriously our walk and our devotion to God? Oh, I've been hurt by people. Okay. Who hasn't? Oh, well, things don't go the way I want them to go in my life. Okay. You know? The Lord loves you. And he did all of this because of his love for you. And he proved it. It's documented in the word of God. The evidence is infallible. It's extensive. It's irrefutable. I'm telling you. That being said, if there is apathy 
in the life of the church today. May it end here today. Right? Just, just take it to the cross today. Let go of it today. Amen? Let's pray. Lord, we just pray right now about the indifference that has prevailed in the lives of so many. The indifference in the lives of the lost, the indifference in, at times in the lives of those that are called by your name. Maybe somewhat different, but maybe somewhat similar. And Lord, we pray this morning, as your word says that all who call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved, all means all, it's all inclusive, no matter who you are, no matter what you've done, the love and the sacrifice and payment of our sins through Christ is greater than any of your sin. He is the Savior, the Redeemer. But is He your Lord? As we're in an attitude of prayer this morning, will you find salvation peace with God today. You can. And it's the narrow way. And Jesus is the way. Today, if this is you, and you recognize your need for salvation, and you recognize that desire to be at peace with God, and you recognize that longing that has begun perhaps to spring up in your heart to call out to God and to receive the most amazing, perfect love that there is. It all begins by putting one's faith in Jesus Christ. And today, if this is you, would you just agree along with me and the rest of us in prayer today? If this is you, will you just echo these words along with me? Just pray these words, Lord Jesus. Just right now, Lord Jesus, I put my faith in you. I ask you to come into my heart. I believe that you paid the price for my sins. I believe that you rose from the grave. And I put my trust in you from this moment on. Come into my heart. Make me new. And... For any of the rest of us in this room today, perhaps this is you. That you've been living a double life. Or you've been living in apathy. <coughs> or you've been living in such a manner that even though you've come to Christ, you've received Christ, you've slidden back. The passion, perhaps, that you once had for the Lord, you've allowed to not be like it once was. 
and you recognize your need to trust God. To come clean. To ask for forgiveness. To be renewed in Him. The Lord wants to break up the follow ground in your life. And if this is you today, would you also pray along? Lord Jesus, forgive me of my sins. Cleanse my heart. Forgive my laziness. Forgive my carelessness. Forgive my weakness. I give it all to you. I lay it at the foot of the cross. And I repent. I walk away from those things and into your arms. And embrace you, Lord. And Lord, we pray, we pray these things because we want to be right with you, Lord. We don't want any valley between us. Lord, thank you for the hope that we have in Christ. Thank you for your love. And Lord, we praise you today. We thank you today. We worship and glorify the name above every name. We pray these things in Jesus' name and all God's church said, amen and amen. Let's